What if there was a different way to live and work? Beyond the hustle and hype, beyond the never-ending race to get more, more clients, more money, more audience, a way that's nourishing, grounded, creative, connected, and still makes a major impact in the world. You're listening to Wellpreneur with me, your host, Amanda Cook. Join me as we explore alchemy and action for entrepreneurs who want to do well and be well. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Wellpreneur podcast. This week, I'm speaking with Marianne Cantwell, the author of Be a Free Range Human. This is one of those interviews I finished with a huge smile on my face because Marianne and I talked about so many topics that are really close to my heart and just so well aligned with this journey of shifting Wellpreneur. So we talk about how to find like the work that you're really meant to do, the work that's right for you. And that doesn't mean following formulas that might fit somebody else. We talk about what brings meaning to her work, how she structures her own work, how she decides what she's going to focus on. And it's not always about just creating monetary goals. And again, not going for what everybody else tells you to go for, but to do what's really important to you and to shift your work so that you're doing those activities and focusing on those things that really play to your strengths, your genius, and the work that you really want to be putting out into the world. We're also talking about Marianne's experience with anxiety and being a highly sensitive person. And we're talking about the importance of doing experiments and little projects to let you hone in on your path forward and the work that you're meant to do in the world. I think you're really going to like this conversation. Also, as a listener of the Wellpreneur podcast, I want you to know that I have just released a brand new website and I am so excited about it. It's totally gorgeous, if I do say so myself, and I'd love if you go check it out. Now, if you're not on my email list, or even if you are, you might want to sign up for this because it's really cool. I've created a new free online program called Find Your Flow. It's six days of bite-sized rituals, remedies, and actions to help you get more more done with ease. So I've heard from so many of you that you struggle with focus and productivity and just not being able to get the stuff done that you want to, spinning your wheels without really feeling like you're productive, right? And and doing your work with ease. And so that's why I've created Find Your Flow. I'd love for you to check it out. You can sign up for free right on the front of my website, which is wellpreneuronline.com. On the website, you'll also find the show notes that have all the links from this episode, everything we're going to talk about, and the link to Marianne's revised edition of her book. And now let's get into this interview with Marianne Cantwell, the author of Be a Free Range Human. Hello, Marianne. Welcome back to the Wellpreneur podcast. (laughs) Hi, Amanda. Great to be here again. (laughs) So we should just tell everybody this is attempt number two to record the podcast. Tell us what happened last time. Oh, Amanda, what happened last time is um, we recorded what was a perfectly fine podcast. And my perfectly fine is it wasn't terrible. There was no static. There was nothing awful that happened. But I got off and I something felt really off. And I sat with it for the whole day. And at the end, I was like, I did not show up on that podcast. I gave you a bunch of really lovely answers and tactics uh, that had completely left me out of the picture because, funnily enough, for a Wellpreneur podcast, the night before I had had a really bad migraine, I'd taken migraine meds and I had you were the first person I spoke to in the morning. I wasn't present. And so I'm so grateful for you when I emailed you and just was like, I'm going to be really vulnerable here. That wasn't my best recording that you said, yeah. <laughs> Like, let's redo that. (laughs) So thank you so much for that. Yeah, well, it happens. You know, I think um, the things that we hear online, like the final polished versions always sound amazing, right? But you don't know what goes on behind the scenes from that, which is that that person did like 30 takes of their video to get it to look so good, or we re-recorded the podcast. Um, So I think it's good that we just kind of put that out there. Like, it doesn't always go well, and it's all right. And actually, it was fine. It was fine, but it wasn't it was like fine. amazing. <laughs> this is going to be amazing. No pressure. <laughs> it better be. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell us about you. Tell us, um, how do you describe what it is that you do? Well, I 
Well, it depends who I'm talking to, to be honest, <laughs> because I'm one of those people who has always felt like I was a little bit of everything. And so when I was starting my own business, I was like, how could I possibly be just one thing? Um, but over time, what I discovered was, as we'll talk about in this, there are so many ways to bring yourself in. So today, the way I describe myself is I'm the author of Be a Free Range Human, a book that was a bestseller in the UK when it came out in 2013, was translated around the world and is coming out again in September 2019 with a hugely revamped new edition. Uh, I was the founder of Free Range Humans, which started life as a little side project blog of my weirdness that then grew into a little kind of a movement that grew around the world. We ran online festivals. We have had courses. We know hundreds of people. We've had like 20,000 people following the brand. And so, yeah, I describe myself as someone who translates the ideas about how we live, about who we are, about what it means to show up as you and create your own thing in a way that's in your flow and translates those best ideas in a way that hits home so we can all do something with it, you know, and live in the best way and be of most service to people. Cool. I really want to dig into that and talk about that. Um, as I mentioned briefly to you and the listeners will know, I am have been on this big journey of personal transformation myself about my brand and bringing more of myself into my work. And I know that's something that a lot of listeners are working on also. I think there's, you know, when you think about starting a business, we can think, oh, well, it has to look this certain way. Like there's a lot of health coaches in my audience and and you'll think, oh, well, a health coach needs to be, well, first of all, very thin, like very thin and buff and fit looking or needs to be drinking green smoothies or needs to only be vegetarian or whatever people's preconceived notions are. And then we can start to try to squeeze ourselves into that. And it doesn't always feel right. Um, So I'm, I'm interested to hear from you, like this whole idea about like bringing your unique self and your weirdness, the stuff that you think, oh, I can never tell people about that, like bringing that into your brand, you know, how how do you feel about all that? I mean, you know me, it's (laughs) that to me is where the best things you will ever create come from. You know, it's so having done this work for 10 years, it's rare to never, in fact, I would say, go out and say it's never that someone says I thrived and I'm top of my game and I'm loving what I do and having huge success with it because I looked at what someone else was doing online and I squished who I was into a box and put it in a cupboard for another day and I just became a carbon copy of them. And that really worked out well for me. Like it doesn't happen like that. <laughs> but isn't that what so many people are trying to do? That's the crazy thing. Like, oh, just follow my formula and be just like, like how many, well, if you think of any of kind of the online guru people, how many carbon copy people are trying to be them? It seems like, I don't know, it doesn't work. Completely. And, you know, and here's why. I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot from myself because I grew up as very much this person who equated success with love. So I felt that I would get validation. I would be enough. When I hit a certain metric, I hit a certain target. I got the right grades was when I felt like you know, I had the most love given to me. And so I grew up as a classic overachiever, top of my class, perfectionist. Um, And there's a lot of value in that, obviously, you know, having the high standards. But I think with that culture, I'm sure a lot of people listening and resonate with the idea of, you know, we are given love when we have success. We are given validation when we hit certain targets. But where that hits is this sense that we need to shortcut our way there by leaving ourselves behind, that, that being who we are is dangerous. And what I've learned over the years, and sometimes a little slower than I should have done, is that the opposite is true, that if we want to be thriving in what we're doing, then it's been the moments where I've done the thing that I thought that's weird, no one's doing that, it can't possibly be enough. That's when things have taken off. And yet, you know, in the past, that's not how I was ever taught. And I don't think that's how any of us have ever taught. We taught to stay safe, stay in your lane and all of that. But it doesn't, where I get interested, Amanda, is that this doesn't equate with the people you're looking at who are thriving. Look at the people who everyone's looking at. Like, did they get there by being a carbon copy of someone else? They absolutely didn't. And so why are we telling ourselves that in order to thrive, we have to be like them? Like the, the lesson that I take from looking at people who are thriving isn't what are the 10 steps they took? 
but rather is what are the moments when they could have left a piece of themselves at the door and they chose not to. And I'm happy to give examples of that mm-hmm. if you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'd love, I'd love to hear some examples, but also a bit about your story and how you, yeah. you know, those moments when you had to bring in the weird. Yeah. Oh, oh so ready. Uh, so, I mean, for me, here's the thing. I, as someone who started out with a, you know, a lot of sense that if I just was smart enough, it would be okay. If I hid myself, it'll all be okay and thrive. It was very inconvenient to realize that the things that really work for me were the moments where I stepped into my empathetic side. So they weren't the moments where I came up with this system no one had ever thought of before. But it was the moments where, like a practical example, things really grew for me when I started many years ago sending out what was then a weekly newsletter. So I hadn't been doing that. It was the earlier days of the internet. I didn't really see the value in doing it. And someone said, you know, that's a good idea. And so I started doing it. But the part where it started thriving and people started flocking to it was where I stopped just giving 10 tips because it used to, by the way, literally be 10 tips um, on, you know, figuring out what you're doing, changing what your life, whatever it is. And I started storytelling and sharing things in a way where I would sit down at my keyboard every week and I'd send it on a Friday. It was called the Friday Love Letters. And I would sit down, I would imagine and think of one person, uh, maybe someone I met in a workshop, maybe a friend, maybe an old version of me, and I would write a letter to them. And I would often I would end up sort of in tears when I was writing it because there's this moment where I would connect so deeply the message I was saying. I was like, oh, that's the line. That's the moment. And I'd write it. And because I only had a few people on my email list with no shame, I'd hit send. And then as the email list grew, I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm bearing my soul. And the replies I got back, the people who signed up to courses, the people who came to our events all the reply didn't say you had such a clever idea. They said, oh my God, you know me, you've met me. Mm. And so for me, my the reason I share that story is the thing that I always thought was my weirdness was that I was the person who could feel what everyone in the room is feeling. And having grown up in a very you know, academic environment where it's all about being more scientific, being more dispassionate, I thought that was weird. And I thought that wasn't okay. Uh, and there's so much more around that. You know, I have had uh, a high anxiety and bouts of depression over the years. And while those have been the most awful moments in my life that I wouldn't wish on anyone, when I'm looking back, I realize that that's every moment of our light has a shadow. You know, every gift and every difference we have, we can look at it and say how great it is when it's working. But you and I both know that it also has a dark side and a shadow side. And for me, the way that my sensitivity and empathy manifests itself is in the darker side of it can slip into depression, it can slip into anxiety, overfeeling and all of that. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, is the conversation that I would love to have with you around that because for years I shied away from being that empath, from being the person who translated feelings into words in a way that hit home because I was afraid of the dark side of it, because I felt that I'd equated my feeling with the moments in my life where I felt so much it was overwhelming. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I love that you started off by saying that, that it was so inconvenient. Like it's so inconvenient that (laughs) this is what actually works. It is because it's so much easier to just be like, well, I'm just going to be the smart person and I'm going to come up with this great thing and I'm going to give everyone 10 tips and it's going to be amazing because that feels so safe. Is that the funny thing is if there's someone listening into this for whom their weirdness or their difference or their, their ease, another way of looking at it is just ease, maybe someone was listening in their ease is giving the 10 steps, is distilling it down, they might be listening into this and thinking, oh, that's inconvenient because how can that be enough? Because I'm listening to a podcast Mm. in which someone is talking about how her empathy and her writing got her where she is. I have to pretend to be more of that. And if that's where the danger lies, Mm. we look at, it's not that my way is the best way, it's that it was right for me. The person who's better at making things simpler oh my God, I love you. We need more of you. (laughs) Like be that, be that person. And this is where the game gets interesting because it's inconvenient to be who we are, no matter who that is. Why is it, why is it inconvenient? Because it should be the easiest thing, right? (laughs) Because 
Well, my view, having done this work for a while and being really just curious about it, my view is it starts when we're pretty young, where it's like the bright, shiny object is the thing that gets pushed down in the schoolyard, is the thing that doesn't quite fit the mold. And so I think we we grow up with the bits that didn't fit early on. So for example, the person who is good at clear thinking, maybe they grew up being teased or watching others who were more like the sparky creatives on stage and going, God, I wish I could be like them because look at the validation they're getting. And I think it's, it mm. really starts when we, or however mm. it starts though, is it, it's funny though, my experience has always been that it's the moments where my ease is, where my flow is, that just don't seem to be enough or they seem to be too much. And I think I always say it's the too much, not enough conundrum. And mm -hmm. yet, and yet that's where the magic lies. The thing that popped up for me is the reason for me it feels inconvenient is because some of that's like, it's vulnerability, right? It's like, mm -hmm. that's your, if that's your real gift, like that's really you. It's not like the face that you're putting on. It's the thing that comes naturally in what you really do. And that's really puts yourself out there then. So I think it's a bit yeah. like, ooh. It is. And also, also the other thing is, you say that really quick, that a lot of it is allowed to be that easy. You know, am I allowed to just connect with people? Uh, is, you know, my colleague Jeannie, she's very good. She's the opposite to me. She's very good at making complex ideas really simple and just coming up with a system. Is she allowed to do that? Shouldn't she be more like me? You know, she spent years trying to be more like me, by the way, crashed and burned, and now she's thriving doing doing things as her. Are we allowed to have ease? You know, uh, the last interview that I did um, actually earlier today with a, a podcaster friend of mine, uh, he asked me at the end, he said, do you ever overhear people talking in a coffee shop who are setting up their own thing and you listen to what they're saying and you just want to go up and shake them? <laughs> if so, what are they saying that makes you do that? And I was like, I can tell you straight away what they're saying. They're making it hard for themselves. They're coming up with this plan and I'm seeing this person sitting there who is an amazing, warm person and they're telling themselves to sit behind a screen all day. They're coming up with a complex plan when actually we have something in ourselves someone else would kill to have. I'm not the super organized 10-step person. And yet sometimes I wish I was. And someone who is that person might spend a lot of time wishing to be me. And what a waste, right? What a waste of talent. I always say, one of the jokes I say to myself is, we don't go around saying, telling a vacuum cleaner that you're bad for not being a blender. You're not like, oh my God, so inconvenient. You're not blending my smoothie this morning. You're just sitting there you know, cleaning my floors. We don't do that. We know what the vacuum cleaner is and we celebrate it for that and we use it for that. So why do we do the different thing to ourselves, right? So what are some of the clues we can use like as we're trying to like figure out what are these right pieces to bring together? What are some of the, yeah, the clues we can follow? I love this. I love this. I love gathering evidence um, for something. Mm. So the first thing I would say is gather some evidence for yourself. Go and one way to do this is to sit down have a look at the times in your past where things have actually thrived for you. So maybe the moment where that one day had a better outcome than the last six months of what you were doing, what was really going on there? So getting curious about that. Number two, to get out of your own way with it, it can be really helpful to actually talk to others about it, people who know you well. And number three, one of my favorite ways is to supplement that with doing a series of different personality assessments. And I say a series because if you just do one profile, like you know, the ones I often use like Wealth Dynamics or Myers-Briggs, you just do one, they're only measuring certain metrics. So you only see yourself through the lens that those metrics have measured, but you do a bunch of them and you start to see a pattern. So for me, for example, one thing I found, Amanda, very inconvenient was I never wanted to be out front in what I was doing. I felt it was safer to be behind the scenes. And the inconvenient thing is that every assessment I did literally told me the opposite. It actually would say, if you are not visible, someone like you will not thrive. If you don't tell your story, you will not thrive. Now, that isn't the case for everyone, but 
every time I did an assessment, like in the fascination advantage, which is a really great profile to do, I came out as the talent. In wealth dynamics, I came out as the star. And I was like, this is very annoying because actually I'm a bit of a nerd. I like to sit at home. I don't like being in big groups. I want to read. Um, I want to like stay with my books. And it was honestly, I can't tell you how annoying it was when I looked at other profiles and said, I'm a little bit like that. I wish I was more of it. But you know, long story short, for me, it was when I started testing, which I encourage everyone to do. I'd run little projects where I'd test out what it was like to be more like the person that apparently I really was. And what would happen is I actually really love it. I actually would start thriving. So I think sometimes for me, it's been in my head there have been this image of what that sort of person should be like and what they should do. But when you actually test it out and say, well, maybe I'll do a little project around it. Maybe I'll you know, launch one thing where I get to do that. Maybe I'll try it out for a week. Actually, the game changes. And you know, we, we go, oh, that feels easy. People are drawn to it. Things are clicking. So I just say, get evidence. Don't sit in your own head. Go and do it. I love this idea of doing little experiments because I, I see all the time people put so much pressure on themselves to like architect the ultimate business. Like, <laughs> what is this amazing thing going to be? And they get really stuck. Like, they just get, they never start anything because it feels so huge. Um, whereas actually, like, as you know, you figure out if you like something by just trying it. <laughs> you know, you figure out pretty quickly, especially what you don't like to do by trying things. So tell us more about this idea of just running these tests. Ooh, that, that's such a big thing. I mean, in the in the Free Range Humans book, in we talk about doing free range projects, which are, by the way, wonderful for recovering perfectionists like me. And they are time limited projects where you set a goal at the beginning. So you set your intention at the beginning and you get clear on what the outcome is going to be. And then you pull it off in that time. So for example, let's just say that you have this grand vision that you're going to go and I don't roll out a way of being a, I don't, a health coaching system that is going to allow people from all around the world to access the best health coaching advice from the best health coaches out there today. And no one knows who you are and you're just starting out. And this health coaching network is such a big project. The free range way would be to say, how do I take the essence of that experience, the thing that I want to experience while doing it, and how do I do that in a time limited way in, in a 30 day project? And the answer might be, okay, well, like one distillation of that might be to get four health coaches in one room or on one webinar and share their best practices. You know, I can't create a network system today because no one knows who I am. Um, I don't know anyone out there. So my first step of getting a taste of the experience of bringing people together is to do that. So that person would then run a project, which is to say, do that workshop, do that webinar. They spend their time connecting with those three or four people. And in that process, what you learn is pretty much everything. That person might learn they actually don't like getting people together, right? They like the idea of having a, a coaching network, but they're not a connector. It's painful. It's like the worst thing they can think of. They don't like chatting to people. So they might at the end of it go, but the thing I love, the thing I got from it is that I love being able to have these ideas together and synthesize them for my listeners so that they were able to get clear steps from them. And they go, oh, maybe that's how I can work. Maybe I can start to create products or events that have really clear steps because that's the feedback I got. That's what I love. It might be they loved getting people together, but they realize they like being the host more than they want to create this big network. So I would always say, create a project, distill down what you're doing because number one, You'll learn what you actually like. But number two, and this is, I think, the big point you're making, Amanda, is you're going to be the person who's doing the thing, not the person who's talking about doing the thing. And that's so powerful. I think that's like the big takeaway for everybody listening is just whatever you want to do, try it. How could you try it? How could you make it easy to try it in the next 30 days? Just a little piece of it and see how it goes. Now, I'd love to talk a bit about um, your personal 
journey and your, I guess, the personal, the way that you work? Because I know that you identify as like a highly sensitive person and that you said you've had problems with anxiety. How do you, I'm just curious, like how that's affected your ability, your rhythms of working, just how it affects the way that you work and how you pace yourself and how you plan your business and things like that. Oh, completely. Every, all of it. Um, (laughs) it, It has touched every single thing I've done. And by the way, just to be clear, at the beginning of when I was starting my own thing, I didn't know that I had anxiety. I didn't know what an HSP, a highly sensitive person was. So it's not that I had labels that I was buying into. I just had experiences I had to work around. It was only over time that I was like, oh my God, there's a name for this. There's actually something you can do with it. So when I started out, all I knew was that I was someone who, despite my best intentions, things would hit pretty hard and I would either go all in or I wouldn't be in at all. So I would be, I'm a very intense feeler. And so the first thing that I learned to do was to work with that, not against it. So for example, I would pace out my year so that it would have intense cycles in it. And then it would have huge swathes of time off which is at the time, no one was doing it like this. People were like, you have to be consistent. You have to work throughout the year. And I was like, that isn't me at my best. I'm going to be incredibly effective working intensely for two months. And then I'm going to go off and need to do other things like paint. And when I started to embrace that, what would happen is those two months would be so effective. We'd do a launch. I'd put something out there that it would ride me over for almost the rest of the year. And so the first thing is I was like, I'm very aware of that having the, being someone with natural ups and downs, you can spend your life working out how to even those out and that there's a lot of value in doing that. Um, but trying to hide it completely was just a useless exercise. So that's one way. And there's so many other ways. Um, I got really honest with myself um, about the impact other people had on me. So I'm not someone who does well going into big conferences in the, you know, the big hotel rooms with a loudspeaker on stage uh, telling us to, to you know, be more motivated. I, in those environments, what would happen is I would get like all the information and I just like, my head would get so full and I'd want to go off and do it. And what I learned in those environments when I was there was that it would be better for me as a sensitive person to leave after half a day. So I would pick which half day of a conference I'd want to go to and I go off and do the thing afterwards. I go off and say, right, I got the thing I wanted. I'm going to go off and do it. So I, so number two was like not getting lost in all the information. You know, if you're someone who has a mind like mine, that maybe is more sensitive, you know, needs a bit more space, give it the space. Uh, and the other thing is I don't really go to those conferences anymore because they don't fit how I work. Uh, there's so many more examples I could give, but, you know, I would just say it was such a relief when I started being my own boss. And I realized you could set your own rules. You could say, guess what? I'm more effective here. I don't have to put the mask on anymore. You know, when I was looking at redesigning what I was doing, the really thought-provoking question I asked myself was, you know what, what if it could be okay to be even more successful, but only do the stuff that I absolutely love? Like, what if I just drop all this other stuff that I think I should do or what makes logical sense? And like, could it be possible if I just do what I love? And Mm -hmm. so that to me is like radical. I mean, it's like what you're talking about. It's like just deciding I'm just going to work two months and then take a couple months off. Like, could that be okay? What would that look like? Yeah. 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 I mean, are, is the like, no, you're not a serious business person. Police going to come get you. Or I mean, what's going to happen? It's your own business. You can do it whatever you want. But we put <laughs> ourselves, we put up all these rules. We invent, uh, you know, all these parameters for ourselves. Um, oh my God. I agree. And I, I love that you, that example you just gave of what you asked yourself, could that, what if I was, could be, have more success. Mm. Uh, a game I love to play with myself is, to, uh, I call it the ease game. And where I will ask myself, what would this look like if it were easy? What if this were easy? And you know, I, you'll love this because I, played that game on a launch I did, a course launch uh, a few years back. And me and my launch partner um, at the time, we asked ourselves, we said, we've launched this product many times before. What would it look like if it were easy this time? 
What would it look like if there was no panic, there was no doubt, there was, you know, if it was fun and easy. And so we played a game, which was very similar to what you said. We set the intention that we would have our most successful launch ever, while it would also be our easiest launch ever. And we set that intention right at the start. And then we looked at each other and we're like, well, we don't really know how to do that. And so we then, and you have to then get creative. So I think asking about how to make it easy is actually a creative question. So we then went, like, okay, number one, we need to have a stronger assistant on this who can really manage it. Number one, we need to get really honest and analytical about what's worked for us in the past and double down on that and ditch everything else. So we actually ditched our affiliates. Our affiliates weren't delivering. They weren't our best way. So we only kept two affiliates, even though it was one of the things everyone wanted to affiliate. We kept two people who had been successful and we ditched everyone else. And so these are the things, you know, you then have to do the work. It's not like, oh, I'm going to set the intention of ease. It's like, yeah, then get creative about what that would mean. Well, it's like a, those kind of questions shift the answers that you're going to get. What is that? There's some quote about that. Like the quality of the questions dictates the quality of the answers yes. you're going to get. And the, to questions like that, like how could this be easier? Or would it be possible for me if I just did everything I like to do and nothing else? I mean, like, whoa, suddenly you get these answers <laughs> coming from like these crazy answers that feel amazing. How do you decide? Like, do you, how do you decide what you're going to work on and what you're going to... Ooh. Like how? Do, yeah, how do you decide where you're going to go in your business? That's such a good question. At, you know, at different times, I've had different answers, um, and it's to do with what's been priority in my life at the time. Uh, has it been you know, establishing my brand back in the day? Like, what was the thing that was really priority? Was it actually you know, bringing in a certain level of income at a certain time? Is it was it creating a smooth path for the future? So I think. The answer always lies in what is my biggest intention in life. And right now, that intention is very, very different to what it was five years ago, you know, when my book first came out. Um, The other year, I, uh, it's a bit of a personal story here, but I I turned 36 uh, and I realized that that was actually two times 18. And that meant I was entering a new round of adulthood. And so I'd ha- you have your first 18 years when you're a kid, you, d- you don't really decide on things. You have your next 18 years when you're thrust into being an adult without knowing what that means. You're figuring it out. And I was like, huh, I've got this next 18 years from 36 to 54 where I get to be adult at being an adult. What does that look like? And I, I went away. I spent my birthday by myself. I was on I actually was in Colombia at the time. I went to this deserted like jungle beach in the middle of nowhere. And I spent a few days working out what it looked like for me, who I wanted to be over the next 18 years. The answers were not a thriving online entrepreneur. The answers were not at the top of your game giving business advice. It was very, it had elements of that, but it was a a very different, much more gentle feeling of being a certain type of creative, of really speaking my truth, of all these uh, all these elements that I put together. And my life decisions since that time, uh, since that time the other year, and my business decisions have been reflective of that. And I give that long answer because I think that's the only true answer. You need to set your course. You know, for me, at so many different times, like when I first hit like the six figure mark uh, back in back in the day, um, a whole bunch of us hit it around the same time. And I remember a conversation at the time uh, in Bali with some pretty you know well known online entrepreneurs and me, and we were all saying, "Hey, you know, we did the thing. We're really proud of ourselves. Now we're going for the next metric, you know, whatever that metric was for them. You know, we all going to do it together." And I remember thinking, "Where does this end?" Where does this external, here's the next big thing to be end? And I I actually took three months offline at that point. Um, I stepped away from the whole scene and I went to think about, do I want to play that game? There's nothing wrong with that game. Do I want to play that game? And I came out and I realized that the life I wanted, being able to paint, being able to hang out with the people I love and write, I could have all of that already without that. If I doubled down on who I already was, where I wanted to go. And so that's my answer is everything I do now from how I'm launching my book to my business isn't about what are the cool kids doing? What are the gurus doing? It's about 
Who do I want to be? Now I set my next step. Now I set my strategy. I think that's as an overachiever, that's by the way, has been a game changer for me. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's hard because I think sometimes, you know, when you're in a in a more traditional job, there's these markers of success, you know, are you gonna have this promotion or this certain amount of money? And when you step off of that, you know, then I mean, at some point I've been working with a couple of clients on this. It's like, yeah, you could go for another big financial goal, but why? Like to what I mean, it's fine if you want to do that, but like to what end? What is the purpose of this? Like what actually at the end of the day, what makes you feel successful? And for a lot of us, it's not at once you hit a certain level, it's not about just getting bigger and bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious for you, what gives your work meaning? What does meaning mean to you? Like having meaningful work? Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? Something that feels true. That's the, the only way I can say it. Something that feels at the heart of it, that it's just got a truth to it. So one metric I set myself um, the other year was that I would only do something if I felt it was something I was, you know, in quotes, best in the world at. And that doesn't mean have to be best in the universe. It might be best in your world. What would I do that is best, that I am best in the world at? So that might mean when I was writing the second edition of the book, and I was going, what are the, the many things we could change in here? I went back to the idea of what gives this meaning and what am I the best in the world at? What is the truest thing to say? And so sometimes it would be, even though I'd have all these great ideas, there'd be a piece of it that would feel so true and would feel so resonant and would get people to connect and go, this is showing me I can be who I am. You know, it is showing me a truth about myself. That would be what went in. And you know, these extensive detailed chapters that are wonderful strategically wouldn't get in because they weren't the truth. They were great and someone else can publish those. Someone else can do something with that. So I'd say something that feels really, you know, really true and talks about like what it means to you know be who we are in every way definitely is is core to what, what I do. Awesome. Oh, this is just this is great. <laughs> I could talk to you all day about this stuff. It's really good. Um, but unfortunately, we're kind of running out of time to chat together. But um, so I guess just in closing, what for, you know, the people out there listening who are like still trying to make trying to figure out how to make their business work and it's not quite working. It's sort of working and they're, you know, they're in that grind. Yeah. What would you say to them? I would say if you are spending a lot of time going online and looking at other people who are thriving and that isn't working for you, then to change the game that you're playing and to change it in two ways. Number one, instead of looking at people who are out there thriving and have been doing it for years and asking what they're doing, get curious about what people did at the beginning that worked. So for example, in my book, I talk a lot about this, like the idea of projects. That's one example. I can give you any success story, I can point out what project they did that brought this big idea down to the ground um, that went for getting their first two clients rather than their first 2,000. So many like that. So, so be respectful of the stage you're at in your business and look for the steps and the guidance for that stage rather than going 10 years in the future because that isn't a helpful place to be. Um, the second thing I would say is also get curious about who you are, all this stuff we've been talking about. You know, the, the strategy and the approach that works for me isn't necessarily the one that works for you. You know, maybe you're not the person who needs to be out front with a big following. Maybe you're someone who actually thrives when people get to know you and trust you. And I can point to you to many less known, but way more successful in terms of impact, equally financially successful coaches who do it that way, right? There's no one formula for success. Just because you see other people doing things a certain way doesn't mean they're the only game in town. So just get curious about this. This is all stuff I talk about more in the book, but get curious about that, the stage you're at and the person you're trying to be, because that can make such a difference. Thank you so much. So tell us about your book when the, <laughs> the next edition is coming out and where people can get in touch with you and find all your good stuff, things like that. Well, the next edition is coming out in September 2019. It's coming out at the start of September in the UK, toward the end of September in the US. But you can pre-order it anytime. And you can look at it at beafreerangehuman.com, beafreerangehuman.com. And it's really for people who 
know they either want to start their own thing or grow it in a way that feels like them, that lets them have the life that they're looking for, be it time, freedom, location, whatever it is. But the heart of it, you know that playing that copycat game isn't really working for you and you want something that has a bit more more depth to it um, as well as being you know, playful and joyful. That's exactly the people we speak to in, in Be a Free Range Human. Awesome. I will link all of that up in the show notes so people can get it um, and go check out the book and your website and all that good stuff. So thank you so much for coming back. I'm so glad we could do this. This interview is like, oh my gosh, I'm just like, I have a huge (laughs) smile on my face. Totally aligned. Love it. Yeah. So much better. Oh my gosh. You're amazing. And I I love what you're doing right now. Um, So thank you for having me back on. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Wellpreneur Podcast. As always, you can get all the links in the show notes, which are available at wellpreneuronline.com. And also, I would love it if you check out my new beautiful website and definitely think about signing up for Find Your Flow, which is my new online series, which is six days of bite-sized rituals, remedies, and actions to help you get more done with ease. Can you imagine that if it felt easy and flowing to do your work rather than struggling with productivity. Awesome, right? Yeah. So that's totally free. You can sign up six days of some little wisdom to shift you into flow. Well, that's it for me this week. Thanks so much for listening. Don't forget to spread the love about podcasting in general. And of course, the Wellpreneur podcast by helping your friends who don't listen to podcasts figure out how it works on their phone, right? It's life changing. I'd love for you to spread the word about podcasting and how good it is to be able to learn on the go. So good, right? Okay. Have a fantastic week, guys. And I will see you back here very soon with the next episode. 